Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome Rev. Lisa Kugler. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit tonight. All right? The fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. So our text is Galatians 5, verses 19 through 23, and I don't have a PowerPoint. So if you want to see me after for any references, I'll give those to you after. Um, in Galatians 5, chapter 5, Paul is going to prayerfully contrast the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit. And um, when comparing these two in our own lives, we can see how close to God we are or where we need to be with the Lord. Amen. Amen? Um, so whatever we're truly living out shows whether it's the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit. So the works of the flesh refer to our natural sin nature or sin tendencies. Um, we inherited a sin nature from Adam, okay? So it gets us off the hook here for a minute. Let me, <laughs> let me give you some peace about this for a second. So when we receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, he changes our nature. Thank you, Lord, right? He transferred his blood to us. He gives us his DNA, okay? No more Adam's DNA, right? The old is gone. The new has come. We are new creatures in Christ. Now we get the Holy Spirit, right? And we get all this good fruit in our life, okay? And so um, 1 Peter 1.23 says this, For you've been born again, that is, reborn from above, spiritually transformed renewed and set apart for his purpose right not of seed which is perishable but from that which is imperishable immortal that is through the living and everlasting word of god the moment you receive jesus god sowed his spirit into you and he sowed his what seed into your heart his word into your heart okay um you hear people say that's just a bad seed. Well, that's just because they don't know Jesus yet. Give them a chance. Okay, there's hope for everybody. Um, and in Genesis 1, verses 11 and 12, and I'm going to refer to a lot of reference or scriptures tonight, but I'm not going to read you scripture, okay? But this is a biblical lesson, and you can see me later. Um, it says that the seed produces after its own kind, okay? So an apple produces an apple, a dog will produce a dog, and a human will produce a human, okay? In the same way, God's seed in you immediately produces the character of God. So you get everything that God is in seed form, all right? And seed produces what? Fruit, okay? So how does Holy Spirit produce good fruit in our life? Well, Galatians 5.16 tells us that if we walk in the Spirit, if we live in the Spirit habitually, we all have routines, we all have habits, but if we walk and live habitually in the Holy Spirit, it says responding to Him, letting go of control to Him, and let Him guide our life, then you will not gratify the cravings and the desires of the flesh, which is the human nature without God, okay? And so the flesh and spirit are in constant conflict with each other, all right? But thankfully, Jesus made a way out of that. And um, we're going to look at uh, verses 19 through 23 in the King James, and it says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. These are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lavish lavishness, which is like excessiveness, idolatry, witchcraft, which is rebellion, um, and some witchcraft, um, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in the past, that those who do those things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Boy, I want to inherit the kingdom of God. Number 22 says, but the spirit, the fruit of the spirit, which is the work of his presence within accomplishes is love, joy, peace, long suffering, which is patience, gentleness, which is kindness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance, which is self-control. And I remember Don said that to me one time. He's like, when you get married, you have to be temperate. And I'm like, what's that? <laughs> you have to have self-control. <laughs> That's another story for another day. 
Against such there is no law, okay? So Christian character is produced by the Holy Spirit. It's not trying to dis discipline yourself and being good for a short time like we do before we actually become, you know, Christians. There's times where people in the world can modify their behavior. They can stop drinking for a while. But what happens eventually without any real change, any nature change or any tendency change, we go right back to those same behaviors. So we need a new nature. That's why we need the Holy Spirit and we need his word to come and live inside of us and produce this new nature and this new fruit. Okay? So a true conversion, um, when a person has a true conversion, they may learn something uh, in the Lord and they try to behave in it for a little while. They do good for a couple of weeks because they heard the message. They think they've arrived, but they find out the lesson comes right back around. They're tempted. They're like, oh man, I haven't got that yet. I'm still learning. But when you're really converted and you really have a relationship with Jesus and you're working with the Holy Spirit, you can't stay in those attitudes. You can't stay in those old sin patterns for very long because your life is uncomfortable. You may struggle and fight God and not surrender for a really long time because there's places in my life that I've gone in battle with the Lord. And it's like, why can't I just let go? And I couldn't understand why I couldn't let go. So I had to say, make me willing to be willing to let go. I know that sounds really weird, but he got me there and I still struggle with it. So, I mean, I'm a work in progress and so are we all. Um, but I said all that to say is that the world has seen enough of the works of the flesh. They are looking for fruit. They are looking for something tangible that they can grab onto and find some hope for their own life, okay? And so um, they're looking for the evidence of Christ in you, right? So there's people who um, have the fruit of the Spirit, and they're working, they're beginning to work on it, you know, they're getting to know the Lord. And they all have these gifts and talents that they start operating in. And they do really well, and they can bring people in. But when those people that they bring in get to know them, and they find all these flaws with them, they start looking at them like, this person is not really walking the walk. They may have a right heart, and they may be trying to, but they're struggling Right, And then there's just some people who camouflage themselves and they have the lingo. They say they're saved. They come in, they try to operate in gifts and talents and they have charisma so it looks good. And then what happens? You go to look, they have leaves, but there's no fruit under those leaves. And Jesus, what did he do when he saw that fig tree in, you know, in the gospels? He's like, well, when the fig tree is, you know, producing leaves, it's supposed to have a fig under it. And he went there hungry looking for some fruit and there was nothing there. And he's like, that's a fake. That's why he cursed it. And we don't want to give that to people. We want to make sure that we're walking the walk, we're working out, and we're making things right with people that we bring in, that we're ministering to, and that we're witnessing to. Amen? Amen. We're going to start out looking at the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. And we're going to get into that one a little bit more than the others. Um, apparently, the Lord wants to emphasize the fruit more than the, um, the works of the flesh tonight. Amen? So the Bible talks about four kinds of love. And uh, in the Greek, when you break down the four types of love in the Bible, there's eros, sturgos, phileo love, and agape love. And when I first learned this, I learned it from Deborah when I became a Christian. And I was like, that was just too much for me. It was way over my head. I get it now about 13 years later, which she was trying to explain to me. But um, the eros love is rarely talked about in the New Testament. It describes a sexual love, like really what we have before we get saved and married and doing the things of God, right? Um, steros is um, primarily a picture of a love and a devotion that exists between a parent and a child or a family member. And the phileo love is like a boyfriend-girlfriend type love. It's like... Um, a friendship, like you just click with someone, you get along, and you, you're adaptable, but you can still have issues, and you're still devoted to them, but it's kind of contingent on, it's still a medium-level love. It's not a really high-level love, and that's talked in like Jonathan and David where they were committed to each other. So then we have agape, which is the highest form of the love of God. It's, it's what Jesus did for us on the cross, and that's referenced in John 3, 16, and it says, for God so greatly loved, which is agape, and dearly prized the world that he even gave his one and only begotten son. So whoever believes and trusts in him as savior shall not perish but have eternal life. Um, this type of love knows no boundaries. 
It's willing to give anything and everything and go deep, far and beyond, self-sacrificing to make a way where there is no way. And that's what the Father did. He gave Jesus, right? Jesus laid down his life. When we receive Jesus as Savior, we too then are supposed to lay down our lives. When we really understand the, the, the love of God and what he sacrificed, what he did, how he forgave us, and what he gave for us, it shouldn't be a problem, to walk in love, but a lot of us struggle with walking in love. And the love walk is huge. And the whole Christianity is defined by the love walk, right? First John 3.18 says, Dear children, let us not merely say that we love each other. Let us show truth by our actions. Love here is agape. It's a force so strong that it demonstrates itself with deeds and actions, not just talking Oh, yes, I love you with the love of the Lord, like Joyce Meyer said. But it's really, you know, yeah, um, I'm really mad at that person. They did me wrong, but I'm going to forgive them, and I'm going to back them up in whatever they're going to do, and I'm going to make a way for them, and I'm going to serve them, and I'm going to sacrifice how I feel and my, what is it, my willingness to be right? <laughs> or, you know, how they say that? It's like we have to give up our, our um, love of being right so we can be in Christ and in his will. And he'll vindicate us if we are right, just saying. He still covers us. Um, but it's not an empty love. It's a love that produces something, okay? Um, so when you really understand the love of God, you'll be able to share it with no problem with others. And really, um, if you look into 1 Corinthians 13, which I don't have time to go into, um, verses 4 through 8, it talks about love is patient, love is kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs, and it, it doesn't, um, it's forgiving, right? And it trusts God and it believes the best, right? That's the kind of love that God has for us. And when we can go through that whole context of scripture and apply it from God to us, you say, God loves me. God is patient with me. God is kind to me. He doesn't hold a record of my wrongs. He believes the best in me, right? He's teaching me to trust in him. Like there, You just apply it to yourself, and then when you have those people that come against you, you go right to that. And I'm still working on that because I have those things too. But the Lord's really wanting to show us that love is more than just talking. And, and sometimes... You know, we get into the situations where we want to gossip, we want to judge, we want to criticize. I'm guilty of this. You know, we have exclusive attitudes where we don't mean to, but we reject people and we leave people out. You know, we've all done that. You know, um, we're supposed to wash feet. We're supposed to serve people. Look for ways to bless them. Invest in their life. Invest in their ministries. You know, and babysit for people. I heard that on Joyce Myers the other day. She goes, quit telling people that you'll do stuff for them and then don't answer your phone. She goes, you need to go babysit for that person. I'm thinking, oh gosh, I think somebody's probably going to call me and ask me to babysit. No. <laughs> but it's true, you know, pay somebody's bill. Yeah, right. You know, give people a break. Everybody's trying to do really the next right thing. And we're all trying to just live in this world deal with all the things that we're trying to deal with, and we got to be good to each other, okay? We're not all against each other. We really do try to work together and try to support each other because people on the outside will know us by our fruit, and they're going to know Christians by the love that's in the church. And they're going to, you know, like I've made a, a mistake of sharing uh, an issue I had in the church with someone, and now she won't come to this church. I thought I could confide in her. I thought she was mature enough in the Lord and in her church that she could process this thing out with me because it was somebody I could counsel with. I was so wrong. I didn't pray about it first. So now she won't come. And I'm thinking, well, that's on me. And so hopefully the Lord will restore that. And at some point she'll be able to come. Um, but in a marriage, there's those that, you know, need to stop pleasing themselves and start pleasing their spouse. In friendships, you've got to stop expecting your own way all the time and start giving to the friendship. Start making an investment in the friendship Stop being the one that always has the problems and start listening to the other person's problems because there's a time that somebody really needs you and they're listening to you and you're like dying inside because you need to share it. You need help, but you just listen and God will bless you in that too. In families, we make a commitment to our spouse. We make a commitment to our kids. God wants us to be devoted to them. He's devoted to us, you know, and sometimes when you get a blended family and you sign on for kids that aren't yours, it's hard. 
But when you make the commitment, I ran away from being a parent with Jacob for I don't know how many years. And the Lord finally said to me, he's like, are you going to commit or not? Because in your mind, you're here and you're here. You're here and you're here. And I'm like, it's so hard. And he goes, yeah, it's hard, but I picked you to do it. And so now we don't have that, but it's taken us all these years to get there, right? So we've got to be devoted. When we make a commitment to a husband and a, and a wife for a blended family, you make a commitment to the kid. Pastor Chris and Teresa are perfect examples of that, what they've done with their families. Um, so saying all that to say, Romans 8, 35 and 39 says this, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, no matter what we're going through? no matter what's coming against us. It says here that nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing, no problem, no issue, no person, no spirit, nothing. So if that's true, then there's no reason we can't operate in the love of God as the Lord is giving us revelation of it. Because he says we're more than a conqueror through him who loved us. So we just have to keep going back in that love walk and revisiting whatever it is he wants to show us. Um, we're going to look at joy and peace. My husband started a business. Someone made a lie against him, tried to ruin his reputation. And the Lord supernaturally gave my husband peace. It took him a little while to listen and surrender. But when he did, he had this joy. He had this peace. And when the person approached him, my husband was able to stay level-headed, was able to keep his mouth quiet, was able to listen, was able to say the things that God told him to say. And my husband was vindicated. So that joy is a supernatural joy that comes from the word charis in Greek. And it's, it's, a, it's a, like grace, okay? It comes from the word grace. And it's something that you can't get happiness from your circumstances always working out. You've got to get supernatural happiness and joy from the Lord. And that peace yeah. comes because of the stability in Christ. Jesus died to give you peace. He said, in the world, you're going to have tribulations, but you're going to overcome them because I'm going to give you this peace. I am in giving you an inheritance of my peace, which is steadfastness, a calmness, so you can hear me and you can operate in the things of God. Um, Peace comes from the word Irene, and in Hebrew, it's shalom. It means that the Lord wants to prosper your soul, your mind, your will, your emotions. He will settle those mind, will, and emotions within all of us. It's not, he's not a respecter of person. He does it for my husband. He's going to do it for me and for all of you. Um, so this dominating peace prospers one soul. Um, so rather than the allowing difficulties and pressures to break us, we have to be people possessed by joy and peace. We have to let the Holy Spirit work in there, okay? Um, if you allow Holy Spirit to work in there, he'll release those things into you. And that's kind of just leaning into his word and leaning into the truth that he's giving you and in the situation. And you know when the Holy Spirit comes on you and tells you to be quiet calm down everything starts changing in the atmosphere you can either keep going or stop and listen to the holy spirit he does make it for you to hear um, let's look at long suffering and gentleness have you ever thought of your thought to yourself i need help with that person i just can't deal with that person anymore <laughs> okay well so <laughs> Sometimes your level of frustration gets you to a boiling point, right? And you start yeah. saying things you don't mean. Um, I went in, I did like five things in the flesh in the last couple of days. I even yelled at someone at Staples and I said, I am not arguing with you. But I was very much arguing with him and I was embarrassed because there was a line of people behind me. And I went out in the car, said, Lord, I'm in the flesh. And he goes, yeah, you're in the flesh. <laughs> then I went and told Courtney, stop talking to me. I'm trying to get spiritual so I can do this lesson trying to get them, I'm trying to study, I'm trying to pray, stop talking to me. And I'm like, okay, that's really godly, right? I'm at my boiling point. So, you know, it is funny, but the Lord's like, hey, we all do it. And so he wants to show us how to be long suffering and just get over ourselves, be able to work with people, you know, because really I start getting phone calls from the same people, my daughter and Courtney, every time I start studying and I'll get like 24 calls like today. And I'm like, just leave me alone. But the Lord's like, no, you need to stop. Be long-suffering, which is being patient with people, acting right while things are not going your way. That's the bottom line. Um, 
And we need that long suffering to be able to get along with people in the world, you know? And long suffering is another fruit. It's similar to love, but it's its own, has its own category. Okay? Because I told Courtney when we did our wedding vows up here, I'm like, I'm gonna suffer along with you. I'm making a commitment. And God reminds me of that all these years later. So um, so it means in the Greek that you're you have a slow um, slow ability to get to anger. You're not going to lash out in anger. You're going to think about it. You're going to walk it out, and then you're going to deal with it normally. You're not going to just go off the edge, okay? Um, Colossians three twelve through 13, I'm referencing this. It says basically that we've been set apart. We're made holy. He loves us. We're his representatives. We carry the credentials of God as Christians, right? People look at us, oh, that's a Christian, okay? So I'm yelling at the guy at Staples, but... I'm a Christian. Um, with this in mind, we're to be even-tempered, quick to forgive. And when people offend us, we got to be able to shake it off quickly and remember what we're dealing with when we're offended, okay? God will show us, yeah. And if we live like this on a regular basis and we don't get a hold of the long-suffering, we'll be irritated with anybody and everybody, including ourselves. Um, so we got to need the Holy Spirit's help to be tolerant with people, Amen. So gentleness is in Greek is comes from the word kriestos, tos something, uh, which means to show kindness or to be friendly with others. Okay, and um, it's it means to be a benefactor or like a philanthropist. I can't even say the word. But in psychology, it's also referring to human relationships and it's being adaptable to others. Um, and it's a supernatural work when you can be adaptable to others right? Because sometimes people need things and they expect you to always change, you to always change, but sometimes you need them to adapt to you and where you're at because you are valid too and you matter too. And what you're going through is real. And so when you work together with the Holy Spirit, that could be so much better being adaptable together. Um, so do you take time to look for ways to be a blessing to other people? Jesus did that. He was always out doing things for people and blessing people spiritually, and he was blessing them um, with their basic needs. And that's what I skipped some of that, but I wanted to say that. Um, so goodness and faith. Let's look a little bit more into that. Acts 10.38 says Jesus went about doing good. And that was the biggest act of spiritual warfare. But also for us, it means that um, Jesus cared for people that were poor. He fed people that were hungry. He gave people things to drink. He provided for the basic needs. He did all the miracles, but he also met just like when I went on my missions trip last week, all I did was go and donate a little bit of money and a little bit of time. And you should have seen the joy on these people's hearts. And I'm like, oh, and my husband's bawling. He's like, oh, I just can't believe this whole thing. And I've never seen him like that. He just, he had his mask like right up here so nobody could see his tears. But that's the goodness of God. That's what God wants to do through us. He wants to reach people hands and feet, right? And it's warfare in the process. So um, faithfulness. We talked about this last week that um, it's a fruit. Um, and it comes from the Greek word pistis. It gives off the idea of one who is faithful, reliable, steadfast, and unwavering. People who are faithful they don't lie and they don't keep changing their mind and they keep their word to you. That's what God does for us. And when you make a commitment to someone and if you don't keep it, you know, like sometimes we overcommit, then you got to look at your schedule. I do this. I am horrible with overcommitting myself. And then I have to tell people I'll be there. And then I got to call and say, I'm not coming or just not say anything all because I'm too embarrassed because it's like the third time it's happened. But God wants me to come up higher in faithfulness. Amen. He might be telling you the same thing. I don't know. Let's um, look at meekness and temperance, okay? These two are the most powerful attributes that we could have as Christians. Meekness is talking about, I'm going to skip some of this. The bottom line with meekness is that it's a person who has got a strong will. And they can bring that strong will under God's um, authority. They can say, yeah, I have all these gifts and talents. Yeah, I've got this, but they're humble, okay? It's power under control. All right, they're not running around throwing their weight around because God will exalt the humble and give, you know, the prideful one won't get that. So temperance is the one I want to focus on the most. It comes from the Greek word in kratos. Bottom line, it suggests the control over appetites and desires. If you have an excessive 
problem with addictions, food, sex, TV, I don't care what it is, shopping, anything in the life that's out of balance, even worrying is an addiction, right? Anything that's out of balance, we have the Holy Spirit that wants to work in this place to help us maintain a life of moderation. What does that mean? Well, it's controlling ourself. It's not controlling other people and everybody else's circumstances. It's the ability to control those excessive areas in our own life. And what happens is when we start, when we lose control of our own life, we want to control everybody else's. Amen? Amen. So God's like, I'm going to give you discipline and I'm going to help you stay in moderation. I'm going to help you deal with your appetites. I'm going to help you deal, deal with the lusts. I'm going to give you the strength that you need and all these areas to say no. And when I want to overeat, the Holy Spirit says, you don't need to do that. And I list, I don't listen sometimes. I say, oh no, I'm going right to the refrigerator and getting, you know, chocolate chips or whatever I want. Right. And so the other day he's like, you do that a lot. And I, and I complain to him and I pray to him all the time about these areas that I'm excessive in. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm excessive. I'm excess and he's like, no, you don't just let my spirit work in you. All you have to do is say, I can't, you can, and I'll let you three st first three steps in recovery for those who know, right? right? That's for everybody across the board. Okay. Um, saying all that pastor, can you come out? To do altar and the prayer team, can you come? I'm working on staying on time with the Lord. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was a lot for this lesson, but you can't really get through each one and there's so many ways to study the fruit of the spirit in the bible it's in the old testament it's in the new testament the bottom line is god wants us to be fruitful and multiply what he gives us amen he wants people to come and search out our tree and find fruit there fruit that they can say that's the evidence of christ i want some of that it's tangible it's real right and above everything that i said tonight is that the holy spirit is in you if you're saved and the word of god is in you as a seed and all the lord wants from us is to press in to his spirit press into the word and pray and rely on him to develop this fruit rely on him to give us the word of you know god that we need in the area you're going to have all these things come at you but jesus died on the cross for your old nature for the works of the flesh in, in your past, in that old thing that you do that you don't want to do anymore. And he says, let me give you Holy Spirit. Let me give you this truth. Let me help you up and out. Let me develop these and produce these fruits in you because you can't do it in your own strength. And that's the beauty of it. We're not supposed to. So if you hit your head on the wall 10 times, good, because you're not supposed to. And so if you haven't received Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you are still struggling with your old sin nature and you want to be free of it you want to have the fruit you want to operate in something new i know when i came into the the you know christianity i was like i was a drug addict i was doing things that i should never even repeat i had an abortion i've had all these things i ruined relationships i hurt people i did every single work of the flesh in there everything and that's not who i am today who I am today is someone full of God's love, full of God's joy, full of God's peace, right? Full of goodness and meekness and temperance. It may not be fully developed, but in the light of eternity, it's already been done for me. He's given it to me with the finished work of the cross. And it's up to me and Holy Spirit to work this out. He's given us resurrection power in our life to work this out. And so if everybody will just 